Hello and welcome to the RPG Blender, where we give lesser played games and forgotten settings the roll the dice they deserve. I'm your host, Game Master George, and today we are continuing our look at running the games in the Kids on Bikes series. This includes Kids on Bikes, Teens in Space, and Kids on Brooms. Previously, we have taken a look at the settings for each of these games. We've taken a look at how each of these games handle their world creation through their unique collaborative world building. We've also looked at the character creation process for each of these games, their unique elements, as well as the fantastic character relationship questions. Today we will be tackling the general rules of running the Kids on Bikes series. These will be the base mechanics which carry over between each of the games. Then in our next video, we'll be looking at each of the unique aspects of these games. The individual rules that get added in in order to build their unique flavor of game. So if this interests you and you want to learn more about this game, be sure to watch this video and subscribe and click that notification bell to be notified when the next parts go live. Without any further delay, let's dive into Let's Run Kids on Bikes, the rules of the game. Going back to character creation, you'll remember that there are six stats. Into each one of these stats, you assigned one of the six standard dice. That's the d4, d6, d8, d10, d12, and d20. These stats and their associated die form the basis of this game's mechanics. Whenever a player would like to accomplish something, they will state what they want to do, and you, the Game Master, will determine which attribute their action fits under. So if your player is attempting to smooth talk their professor, you'll tell them to make a charm roll, and they will roll the die associated with their charm statistic. At its base, that's how simple this system is. There aren't that many unique mechanics that you need to remember. In the end, every action is going to amount to rolling the die associated with whatever stat is being used. Now, of course, there's more to the system than that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making this video. But at its core, this is the mechanic that makes this system. Now, when your player is making their roll, you as the game master will assign a difficulty class. This is the target number that your player is attempting to roll in order to be successful with their attempt. As your player's dice range from a d4 to a d20, the difficulty classes should, in general, fluctuate between those numbers, depending on how easy or hard the task is. You may be looking at this and thinking, hmm, with a d4, there's not much I'm going to be able to do with that statistic. And you would be almost correct. You see, this system uses exploding dice. If you ever roll the maximum number on one of your dice, you will roll again and add the new total. You will continue rolling and exploding for as long as you continue to roll the maximum number on the die. Or, until you have passed the target number. So if the target number is 17 and you have a D4, you would need to roll a four four times in a row in order to reach 16, and then your next roll would meet or exceed the target number being your last. Obviously, this is not very likely to happen. It is a rare chance that you would be able to explode that many times, even on a D4. However, that's what keeps those lower numbered dice relevant. You see, a D4 has a one in four chance of exploding every time you roll it. Compare that to a D20, which has a one in 20 chance, and you're going to see explosions more often with your D4 die. In practice, I've found that that means that you get a lot of rolls with the D4 in the five to seven range. One explosion tends to be fairly common unless you're one of my players, where you get an average of three. Once you have your final rolled number, you will add any modifiers that you have from any strengths or from your age bonus. This will give you your final roll. Depending on how much you meet or miss the value by, you will find that there are different effects. For instance, if you only beat the DC by one or two, you succeed, but not impressively. You're not going to get very many extra benefits. Meanwhile, if you manage to exceed the target by plus 10, you have a truly epic success which should lead to you getting some extra benefits. If you fail your roll by 15 or more, then you're in for a catastrophic failure. These consequences could, or should, depending on your outlook, seriously derail the course of the game. If your players fail their roll, all is not lost. Whenever they fail their roll, they get an adversity token. 
adversity tokens are used in order to activate some of their strengths or in order to pump up their rolls. So if you had a difficulty roll of eight and you rolled a seven, you could spend an adversity token to increase your roll by one, bringing it up to the target number of eight. You can spend a number of these on a single roll attempt, so each failure that your players get will actually serve to increase their likelihood of succeeding at their future very important roll. This is the standard rolling mechanism. You will roll your stat, explode if you rolled the maximum number, add any appropriate age bonuses, and then get to spend adversity tokens in order to pump it up. However, there are two different types of actions which will modify these slightly. Every action that your players attempt will be either a planned action or a snap decision. A planned action is something where your players are able to know what's coming ahead of time and have time to prepare, to make themselves ready, to act with forethought and preparedness. In such a situation, there are some modifications to the way this role is handled. If your players choose when they are making a planned action, they may take half the maximum value of the die. So if they're rolling a d20, they could forego the roll and instead just take a 10. Same for an 8, they could take a 4, or a 4, they could take a 2. This serves to give them some measure of predictability when they have the time to stop and think through their actions ahead of time. However, they could always choose to roll that die for the risk of getting a low number, but for the possible benefit of getting a higher one. As well, your other players may use their adversity tokens to help the player making the roll. This simulates them being able to work together to contribute to the success or failure of the action. On the other hand, when you have a snap decision, you must roll the die, and only the player making the action may spend their adversity tokens. Now normally, when you use a planned or a snap action is purely dependent on the situation that you find yourselves in. If your players are under pressure, needing to make actions in the moment, those are going to be snap decisions. However, if they have the time to stop and think, then they will be having a planned action. If a player's fear comes into play with the action, then they must make a snap decision. Regardless of whether the other players are making planned actions or snap decisions, you may not spend adversity tokens in order to help them on their rolls. Finally, at the GM's discretion, they may apply a penalty to the roll if the fear is particularly vivid in that moment. This leads us to what will more than likely be the source of the fear, and that is combat. Combat is a little loose for my tastes. Now, that works very well for the rest of this system. Everything is very loose, very up to the game master and the players in this kind of negotiation about what they can and can't do. And that rolls over to combat as well. Unfortunately, this game does not have very hard and set mechanics for its combat. Instead, it opts for a one roll resolution. So, when you get to combat, the aggressor will decide what kind of action they are doing. More than likely, this is going to be a fight roll, though it could be a brawn roll in the event you are trying to grapple somebody. Most of the time, however, the aggressor will be rolling fight. They will state what they are doing and then make their roll. Meanwhile, the defender will state what they're doing to try to mitigate that roll. This could be a fight for a kind of parry maneuver, it could be a flight if they're attempting to get out of the way, or it could be a brawn if they're trying to tank the blow. They could also try more unique approaches. They could attempt to somehow charm the person or use their brains to get out of the situation. Most of the time, however, you'll find them using the three physical statistics. Both of the characters will then roll that statistic, and the results will be compared. If the defender meets or beats the attacker's roll, then they have successfully defended from the strike, and they get to narrate the outcome. However, if the attacker wins, then the attack manages to get through, and the threshold by which they succeeded determines just how bad the damage is. Now this carries one very interesting side effect. There are no pulled punches in this system. If you are rolling an attack against another creature, there is always the chance that you might accidentally kill them. If the attacker's roll beats the defender's roll by 10 or more, that means the defender is, as a result of this attack, dead 
or nearly dead. This is hugely consequential as any combat action with the threat of exploding dice could easily turn into a lethal scenario. There is no way for your players to decide, well, I'm only doing non-lethal damage. If they are attempting to bash them on the head with their fists to try to knock them out, there is the chance that they get that huge roll and it connects with just the right place in their skull, or they fall on the ground and hit a rock which cracks their head. Anything could happen in the moment that they decide to throw punches. Now, there are other steps within the damage track, but there are not really mechanical consequences to being injured. The game talks about the different injuries that might be sustained at the different thresholds of success. However, there's no real mechanical benefit or penalty to them. It is on your players to roleplay their affliction appropriately. This is where, again, what I was talking about with the system for combat being very loose comes into play. If you don't have players who are able and willing to roleplay the damage that they're taking, you might have a hard time with this combat system. Now, if that's the case, I do find it easy enough to simply start applying penalties to their roles. These penalties can quickly add up to some lethal consequences. If they try to fight through their debilitating injuries to try to get a final swing out on this creature, it becomes much harder for them to avoid that minus 10 threshold if they're sitting at a minus 4 penalty. And since they've already failed once, it seems likely that they could again. And now, that's about it for the base mechanics of the game. The game's rules are very simple and straightforward. There's nothing overly complex or out there about them. It's a system where you are in more narrative control than you might be used to with a very crunch-heavy game like Exalted or Dungeons & Dragons. This is a game that lies between the roles, where it's the things that are leading up to the roles and then the consequences of those roles which matter more than tactical combat. If your players are looking for this kind of roleplay first interaction, then this is a good game for you and the rules back it up. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. This has been a quick rundown of the general rules of the Kids on Bike system. With our next video, we'll be diving into the unique rules of each of the variants of this game. Each one of them has their own pieces which do not exist in the others. These are the setting specific rules which help to build the atmosphere of their unique inspiration. So if you found this helpful, if you would like to come back to watch our next video, please like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps us to know that what we're doing helps you. And of course, it helps the channel to grow. Meanwhile, if the game of Kids on Bikes interests you, you can pick it up at the affiliate link in the description. You'll add a new RPG to your collection and help support the channel. And if you'd like to see us as we tackle some of these games live, go ahead and follow our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash RPG Blender. We just finished up a play of Kids on Brooms, where we demonstrated some of the craziness that goes into this game. You can, of course, check out those recordings here on YouTube. Playlist in the description. Anyway, thank you again, and remember, there's gaming outside the Forgotten Realms.